they're the stories in scripture that are, are like, you know, you read them and you know them and you're like, oh yeah, of course, you know. Huh. And then there are these like accounts in the scriptures that no matter how many times you come back to them, you go, what? Huh? One of my favorite wah ha stories is what I'm about to reenact for you. And, it, and, and, and kind of at the heart of it is this idea that if, if I could impart to you anything this evening and, and, and send you away with like this sort of one-liner takeaway, it would be this. It would be beware of eunuchs in chariots. Um, just as a rule, um, just a weird scene, really is. Uh, as the story goes... Philip, a member of the early church, a small band of believers who had come to the knowledge of Christ, hears from the Spirit of God. This is a very strange occurrence for anyone, especially at the time. And the Spirit says to Philip, go south. That's all he says. I love that. Go south. No destination. Just go south. He tells them what road to go by. Don't go by the, don't, don't go by the main road. Go by the wilderness road. And just go south. So he listens. Starts heading south. And as he's heading south, he runs into an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot. You know, like you do. And uh, if you're from my neck of the woods, you run into like a eunuch in a chariot. You're in Berkeley, California. And that's just how that goes. Uh, he's there every day. But it's a strange occurrence comes across an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot. And when he sees the Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, he's looking across not just whatever road or street there was, he's looking across at an enormous cultural gap. Huge. Philip's a Greek man. Brother's an Ethiopian eunuch. There might, there's not a lot of commonality between these two people. And the Spirit speaks again to Philip and he says, I hear the words, and, and I'll, quick side note, particular to this, there are moments when the writers of the scriptures, Old Testament and New, are very, very, very intentional about the words they choose to describe a situation. And this is one of the situations. And the writer of Acts describes the voice of God in Philip's mind as saying, go to the chariot and stay near it. Go to, stay near Here's why I think this is significant. Because this is not the language of agenda. It is not go to, drop it off, and get out. It, it's not get close, but don't get involved. Go to, stay near. Other translations will say the word go to, but they say go to that chariot and join it. Go to and stay near. And as Philip is standing near the chariot, he hears in the chariot the Ethiopian reading Isaiah, a book that Philip would probably be familiar with as a member of this new body of believers who are looking back into the Old Testament scriptures and the prophets and seeing Jesus described by men from hundreds of years ago. He, he would hear this scripture, he's listening, note that he would have had to stand there long enough, near enough to hear what was going on in the chariot. Note also that the word of God was active before Philip got there. The word of God was there when he got there. He didn't have to deliver it. It was there. And he asks into the chair, he says, do you, do you know what it is you're, do you understand what it is you're reading? And the, and the Ethiopian says, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? This has been my experience. Maybe it's been your experience. I've never really needed someone to come into my life and tell me who I am. I've needed people to come alongside me and help interpret what God is actually doing already. Because this is what I really believe. I believe that God is just simply active everywhere, every nook and cranny. If we're talking about a sovereign God, we're talking about a God who's act active in every dark corner of every dark culture on the planet. It's a question of whether or not people can go to and stay near long enough to hear what's going on there and then have the courage to ask, do you understand what's going on in your own life? And as in this conversation that begins, the Ethiopian asks Philip this, would you get in? 
Go to, stay near, get in. And it's not until Philip is in the chariot with this culturally divergent person that the conversation turns and the story, these, these, these two lives, these two men whose stories are sincerely distant from one another become intertwined. Philip's feet are off the ground. He's no longer in control of his own life. Wherever this chariot is going, that's where he's going. Wherever this eunuch is headed, that's where Philip is headed. And it's in that setting that the conversation turns towards Christ. And like I said, the one story that I believe is the story of which all stories are but a shadow and a shade. And Philip gets to explain and talk this eunuch through this meta-narrative. And the eunuch asks this question, and I love this intentional phrasing. Is there any reason why I shouldn't be baptized? Is there any reason why I shouldn't? Not because Philip had built a case for him, but because Philip had helped to remove the obstacles that are in the way. God had begun a work already. God was present there. What was needed was the removal of, of obstacles. This is part of why I do compassion is because in most of these kids' lives, it is poverty that is a major issue in the understanding of a good God. How, go, how good could a God be who allows my family to suffer and die in poverty? We need to remove that obstacle and kids can see the goodness of God. It's not about building a case. It's about opening people's eyes to see how good he already is. And so I think about some of the songs, one in particular, that I, that I chose for the cover, the covers album, and I think about some of the names in American music who get set way outside as if they're sincerely Ethiopian eunuchs. They're out, they're just culturally, we don't understand them, we don't maybe even like them, and so they couldn't possibly have... But who has the courage to go to those chariots? Because if I believe what I believe about God, then I believe he's present and active in that person's life. It's just that he can't see it. So who has the courage to go to Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails? And sit down with Trent and look through his lyrics and be like, hey man, there's some really good stuff in here. I know you've got some real issues with culture and with the church, but so did a lot of the prophets. And I'll dig into that a little bit more. But this is a song that I cover for this record and the very specific reason of saying, yeah, Trent Reznor had some major issues with who God was, at least the way he understood God culturally. But the prophet Amos had some major issues who, with who God was and how he was understood culturally. And if you, it, as the more I paid attention to what Trent was doing, and I'll dig into it in a second, uh, the more I see a very, very beautiful parallel between the criticism of Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails and the criticism of many of the Old Testament prophets, specifically the prophet Amos. So this is my little folky render, rendition of, uh, of Nine Inch Nails, uh, Head Like a Hole. <laughs> 